I'm Don Garcia. I am the director of the John S. Knight Journalism Fellowships Program and the co-host of this course with Michael Bolden, who's here in the front row, who's the JSK Managing Director for Communications. So this speaker series is a collaboration of the John S. Knight Journalism Fellowships Program and Stanford Continuing Studies. Each of the five nights, we are uh, devoting the conversation to five important issues for the JSK Fellowships Program and for journalism. Tonight's class, which is the third, <laughs> thank you, is how journalists cover bias, intolerance, and injustice. And tonight we've invited journalists who will provide a, ver a variety of perspectives on this topic. The first part of the evening is going to be me in conversation with Richard Louis who's anchor for MSNBC and NBC News. And Richard has reported from around the world on a range of issues, including human trafficking, and he's led conversations on the state of race in America. We'll take a short break after our first session. We'll have a chance for questions as well. In the second part of the evening, Geraldine Moriba, who's a 2019 JSK fellow and founder of Moriba Media, will moderate a panel of journalists who deal every day with issues of diversity and inclusion and coverage on a range of issues from Muslim communities in America to how to encourage diverse voices to be heard uh, and read on the op-ed pages of the New York Times. Uh, as I said, every evening as we've done before, we will have a chance for questions. Erica Bartholomew, waving her hand over there, uh, will have index cards if you'd like to have any questions and then just pass them toward that Erica side of the auditorium. And we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end of each session. Just a final reminder that a full syllabus for this course and readings, links to sites we think are interesting and helpful and recommended books are on the Canvas site. And uh, as I said, no quizzes, but we hope you find those materials interesting to help you with your understanding of journalism today. So tonight's topic, how journalists cover bias, intolerance, and injustice. I'm going to introduce Richard just a little bit more because he's got a great, interesting background and uh, some local connections here. So he's, as I said, been at MSNBC, uh, an anchor since 2010. And he spent five years at CNN Worldwide, most recently with CNN Headline News. He was a solar an solo anchor of the 10 AM hour of a morning express. And he led political reporting throughout the 28th presidential election. Being a California, native California myself, I was interested to see Richard's California ties, and there are many. He grew up in San Francisco, uh, 16th and Geary, he mentioned, and his passion for uh, covering politics, knowing about politics, started in the 1970s um, on bus rides to school when he was debating Proposition 13. This is a nerdy guy. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was fun. <laughs> so, but that interest turned into a job at age 19. He was campaign manager for a San Francisco College Board incumbent, Alan Wong. So, um, he, he lost, by the way. That did year. he? Yeah, oh, well, shoot. Uh, okay. So, I'm that uh, good. Oh, well, it was your first job. We'll give you some slack there. Uh, in the 90s, he reported for news radio KALX. I'm thinking that's Los Angeles. No. Uh, CalX uh, no? Go Bears. Okay. Sorry. Oh, Berkeley. Sorry. Yeah. Ah, sure. yeah. Okay. Hold that the eggs. That other place. That other place. Uh, we have the better colors. Yeah. During a really <laughs> interesting time, he was assigned stories including Diane Feinstein's first mm -hmm. uh, Senate campaign and the Rodney King verdict and riots, of which I was an editor at the Mercury News at the time wow. during that coverage. Yeah. yeah. Um, he spent 25 years in community service, which is not something all journalists do, I would say, um, if, unless you do community service for your community in general. But in Africa, Asia, the United States, volunteering for the um, Asia Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies and many other, other areas. He's also had a career in startups and technology companies uh, here in Northern California. He earned his BA, okay, you, you, yeah, University of California, and Master's in Business Administration from the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. One interesting personal note that I found really, really heartening and wonderful about Richard is that a few years ago, he decided to spend more time in California. He is in, you know, working, of uh, course, in TV as he did in New York, but his father got Alzheimer's, and he decided to work with his boss and devise his schedule so he can split his time between New York and San Francisco. 
And uh, I, we talked about that a little earlier, yep. so it's really a, a wonderful thing to do. So let's start. Let's do it. Okay. So. Um, and thank you. You're welcome. It's great to have you. It's yeah. good to be here at yeah. TSK. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> We had some discussions earlier. Um, you know, this is a time where issues of prejudice and big, bigotry are mm -hmm. on the rise, and journalists uh, have to navigate some pretty interesting issues of personal identity sometimes when right. they're right. to uh, to inform the public on these issues. You were the first Asian American male to anchor a daily news broadcast in America, if I have that correct. Um, what was that like, and did you know you were a first? So uh, it's, it's interesting, Don, because this was at CNN, and um, uh, it was not necessarily one of my objectives, but when I first decided to move from business into journalism, as we all do, being good students, we look for other benchmarks, folks you can learn from, get some advice, you know, steer the ship one way versus the other, and I found that I did not find anybody that looked like me yeah. that I could say, hey, what's going on, right. specifically. So I reached out to others that maybe have gone or were going through similar pathways. You did not need to be Asian, nor did you need to be male. You could be female going through a shift in your career at the age of 40. You could be in broadcast news. Right. Uh, you could have been African-American and male and just starting out in uh, TV anchoring. So that, that was what I was, I was trying to understand. The thing about it was, I didn't know that there was nobody else out there. And that was surprising to me. Yeah. And then what I realized after going on air is I, I had to own it in a way that I didn't think I would have to own it. I, I realized that before I would say anything or do anything, there were certain understandings or suppositions about that which I was about to say or what I might represent. And that was for me something that took about five to 10 years to say, okay, I'm just, this is what I am. Uh, Asian American guy, I'm gonna tell some Asian American stories, but 98% of my other stories are not about that. They're about America. They're about all the corners, all the great spaces, all of the great profiles right. and interviews and things that we sometimes make us grimace and sometimes make us smile. And yeah, occasionally I will do one of, of those stories, but really trying to own that mm -hmm. this thing took a long, long time. And I did not get into journalism to sit on a, if you will, the long couch with a, a, and going through my own psychiatry. <laughs> I did not do that. <laughs> but I had to go through that because that was, I think, sort of forced upon me, but in a good way. I think I am stronger for it. I think that I'm more realist about the way this sort of difference is. Cause I don't find, a, it, it's actually I find more sameness at the end of all of this conversation. Yeah, talk about that, the sameness. What do you see when you look at it, stories that you're doing across America? So when I'm doing stories, um, so for instance, I was sent out to um, Ferguson in Baltimore during very difficult mm -hmm. times for our country. I was, as you mentioned also, one of my first stories was uh, about Rodney King right here in California and something I didn't know about our great state, that we would have this sort of pain that had not been talked about and released and, and, and faced, right? Um, and so when I've done stories about different ethnic groups, we'll say, since we were talking about that, for instance, there was one story up in Seattle, uh, Washington, um, and there was a fantastic um, uh, operetta uh, called The Mikado. And it has been played for 100 plus years, right? Maybe some of you have seen the operetta. It, but the issue with it, Don, was that it put all of its actors, because the, the criticism that, that, that the, the, the playwrights were trying to, to make of was of the British government. But they couldn't, because if they were to do that at that time, they would have been, you know, all sorts of different things would have happened to them. <laughs> so they set it in Japan. And so for 100 years, this criticism of government happened in the construct of Japan. And so the actors most often were not Japanese and would wear uh, makeup on their face so they would appear to be uh, those old uh, caricatures of what Japanese might be, which is a white face, right? right. With a white right. um, makeup. 
I started the piece, and the way I pitched the piece was about how we went through similar characterizations of another group in America, and that happens to be African Americans, <laughs> uh, Little Black Sambo or Al Jolson, and, and the way I pitched it to my editor was I, that's what I led with, and because like, the way we pitch stories is it's one paragraph, and then you send it off to your executive producer. I led with that in my in my pitch, yeah. and I said it's still happening today, but in with Asians in America. And so when I flew up to um, to Seattle to do that story, you saw a whole just like this room uh, representing all the faces in this room standing out, saying we can't do this anymore. This is not good to have you know actors wearing yellow face, not black face, yeah. walking around like this, you know, and bowing, and with very strange little names that they were given, and they, they were talking in the ching chong sort of way on, on stage, and we, we just don't do that anymore. It's just, yeah, yeah, that's the way they did it 100 years ago, but guess what? It ain't 100 years ago. <laughs> it's not. No. Uh, and what was more surprising, which I learned when I was up in Seattle, and this was, uh, again, uh, what was very racially charged for the Japanese American community, this was where the very first Asian American civil rights group was ever formed in America, JACL, in Seattle, in Washington. Seattle. And so there we are, the birth of the Japanese American civil rights group. And this very play is happening. And, and so that was a way of talking about difference, but sameness. And then, I mean, the way we ended it was there's going to be a conversation that's going to happen. And there was a conversation mm -hmm. that happened, a lot like this. We all, they all gathered later on. And they decided, guess what? We don't need to do it that way anymore. Oh. And the producers were not these horrible people that some of the statements were. They, they were learning, too. Right. And so they adjusted the operetta. And now it's better. The communities are getting along better now. And they understand right. something about them. It's right. one of the oldest Japanese-American communities in our country. Yes. Well, that's great. I did not know that about yeah. that story. I didn't either. So we're going to keep on some questions about you, because you have an interesting background and in, in family history. So we had been talking earlier that so you're a first generation American. And you, you mentioned in, that your grandfather was an undocumented or illegal. We've talked about the word. The words are important. Yeah. Immigrant uh, to this country. How, how does your life experience and having that family background affect right. your coverage of the very hot topic of immigration. So this is really interesting. The way I remembered this was I, wa I was on CNN. We just finished doing a story about immigration. And then we went to break. And I was sitting there, you know, as I normally am doing, during break, I kind of take a breath. And I look and see what our next segment was going to be. And I thought about it. I was like, hey, wait. This story about immigrants in America here illegally, that's, wait, wait. That's my background. Mm -hmm. Now, why did it take me? 20 years basically to go, that is me too, or my family story, was because I had to, it, what clicked into my brain was I remember when I went to the cemetery when my grandmother passed. And my last name is Louie, by the way. We show up and we unveil the tombstone. And it says Wong on it, W O N G. And I'm like, you know, I'm 15 at that time. Like, Dad, are we really that cheap? <laughs> was that that good of a price? You know, well, us Asians, we're a little cheap sometimes. So I was like, well, that's kind of crazy. But what he found out, my father found out in his 40s, because he walked over to his oldest sister, and his oldest sister said, Grandma did not want us ever to bring this up, because she was afraid the entire family was going to get pushed out. So even during the 50s, when the government said, it's A-OK, -okay, Grandma still said, no, we're not going to tell them our real last name. Wow. So my, uh, yeah, my, my real last name is Wong. I'm really Richard Wong. I have the Wong name. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good night, everybody. No. <laughs> I just want to see if we're, we're all still awake right now. Oh. But so then yeah. fast forward to right. CNN. We're doing this, this uh, segment on uh, immigration. And that's when I said, oh, that's me. Yeah. Oh, wait, that's America. That is what we've gone through, whether it's a left or right administration. We've gone through solutions 
given this dynamic of right. what we represent to the world and right. what we represent to each other here in the United States. And so that was that realization. And then, so when I do do stories on immigration, um, and for instance, I was doing, a, we were talking about this earlier, I was doing mm -hmm. a, um, a story on dreamers. And there's a significant number of dreamers, kids that were brought here, brought here from Asia. Just like when you talk about the undocumented or unauthorized or the illegal immigrants here in the United States, there's about 11 million, many people say, one out of 10 are from Asia. So there's a million of folks that yeah. look like me. And those are my grandparents. Yeah. Those are my grandparents when they came here. And so it was one of the first stories I did at CNN, by the way, was on this right? thing called Paper Sons. Um, and the reason why, there's, which we can talk for a long, long time. But now when I'm talking about immigration, I want all sorts of different faces. Because we have, we have folks that have gone through the story that are, mm -hmm. have white faces, black faces, uh, brown faces, purple faces, yellow faces. And so when I do segments, I put them all up just so we understand it's just not one background. So I take right. that, that part of what I f remembered I right. was yeah. and I certainly make it part of my storytelling. Am I gonna stand out and say, this is good or bad or no. What I'm going to do is say, I have a unique understanding of the topic and I'm gonna to try to bring more information to you so you can hopefully take it to your water cooler. I'm not, I, you've never, you're not gonna hear me say it's good or bad. That's not what I'm mm -hmm. gonna do. Okay, great. So let's shift it a little bit. We're, we're talking tonight about how journalists cover Tolerant, intolerance, bias, injustice. So there's a real tension, I think, between two mandates in journalism. So on the one hand, there's a commitment to what has been called objective reporting. Uh, and the other is shining a light on injustice in our society. And these two things are both values in journalism. Um, this tension, I think, has become more apparent in our current politicized uh, moment when um, there's many issues that come up for all kinds of people, and right. some of those people are journalists as right. well. So just thinking about life experience and how you cover things from who you are, from what you've seen. So you know, where does journalism end? What is too far? Yeah. Uh, what is activism? What is journalism? Sure, 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 sure. Um, so I'm very active in the space of fighting human trafficking. I'm very active in the space mm -hmm. of gender equality. And the reason being is because the two of them are quite intertwined, if, if you understand human trafficking and why we see markets of trafficking around the world that are unfettered and yet very equivalent. And w one might say, okay, uh, if you say that's wrong, is that activism now opinion? Is it no longer journalism, right? Because mm. I'm saying human trafficking is wrong. But I would ask any journalist if, who would say human trafficking yeah. is good? Any journalist that might say misogyny is good or gender inequality is right. good. So I think there are certain spaces in this difficult time. I, I have clearly said such things within you know, recent cycles, and I think many have. I'm not unique to this space that has said, no, there's no way that we will accept such language, number one. We will not accept the treatment and the representation of women in such ways. Clearly, I will join the ranks. Will I overstep myself and say it is a gargantuan campaign against one half of our humanity? No, I won't say that. Mm -hmm. That is not as far as I will go. I will go to what I know is true, and that is the numbers say X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. When we're looking at those who are trafficked, the majority are women, whether for sex or for labor. Mm -hmm. When we look at the numbers when it comes to earnings power, very obvious to all of us. When we hear certain words, there is no false equivalence. There is, there's no equivalent to be brought to it. It is just wrong. Now, there are other spaces where often, and I know many of you in this room have gone through the very debate, either because you're in the space, you're in media, you're in journalism, where we will try to bring a balance to the argument. Now, me being a rhetoric major, I love that. <laughs> you know, I, I will, if there is something on the other side, I will, I will try to build the argument uh -huh. so I understand my, my argument. I don't necessarily agree with it, per se, but that's not about whether I agree with it. You know, you get this, asked, this question all the time. Right. Do, do you ever tell stories you don't agree with? 
all the time. But that's not my job, right? I, in fact, it, it, all the journalists in here know that. It's, so there's lots of things we have to talk about that we may not agree with. Right. But that's not our job when we put on the journalism hat. Our journalism hat is to say, what, what are the facts? Right. What's the story? Who are the humans behind this? Right. So uh, talk a little bit about how you got into um, an interest in human trafficking and trying to stop that from happening around the world. Well, I know that's the very topic that, that we're in right now. Um, I, it was, so I, I'm not a good reporter when it comes to trafficking. And what I realized is I was one of those reporters early on, and I still struggle with it, to sensationalize um, women and girls. My first story on human trafficking was in Batam, Indonesia. And I went to my editor over at CNN and I said, I want to do some undercover video. I'm going to bring in a camera. And so I went down into the brothel. Um, I had my producer with me who was local. I could not speak Bahasa Indo Indonesia, which is the local language, so he could. Mm -hmm. I pretended that I was the foreigner wanting to buy a girl for 24 hours. Uh, he pretended to be, you know, my fixer that you can get when you go to Indonesia. And then the, the, the house mother stood right there. Mm -hmm. Producer was here, translating for me. The girls came in into a space that's about a third of this big with a, a glass counter, which looks a lot like the Safeway counter when you go to buy your, you know, wow. your meats and chickens and things like that. The fluorescent lights were above all of them. And then you saw the girls come in, 15, 14, 12, and I bought, and, and you, being the house mother, said, she's the popular one. She's the newest one. Mm. Um, she is the most expensive one. She is from this area. I got the most popular one and paid $25. And then the, she hit another bell. They all got up and they walked out the door. The one that I had picked for $25 said, can I, the house mother said, she can go back and change. She came back. She changed out of her negligee, again, 15 years old changes into street clothes, and then we proceed to walk up the stairs out from underground. And the one thing that stood out in her bag was a teddy bear. And when we got to the hotel, I told her, we're journalists. You can leave now. We, we want to tell your story. We will protect your identity. We'll, you will not see your head or, or face. And so she said yes, but I, realized five to 10 years later in the course of that time, this was about 10, this was 10 years ago when I did the story, is that I, we left her behind. We did protect her face and identity, but we knew that if somebody really, 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 and so I, I didn't like the fact that we went through the proper steps. We could have done more. I wanted to do more and do better. Um, and so since then, I have changed the structure of my stories and tried to, to not be, there's a lot of problems with that story, is that it was over there. It was in Indonesia. When here in the United States, the Justice Department says we have anywhere from like 30 to 40,000 trafficked yeah. sex slaves here in the United States. So my stories have now moved towards what's happening here in America. Because if we believe it here in America, guess what, we're, we're pretty resourceful here us spending a dollar or spending a calorie of our energy to do something, we can change so much. So now it's a focus of telling stories about brothels in America, which exist, these neighborhood brothels in every state in our country, which was one of my first investigative pieces when I first joined 30 Rock. And I've tried to refocus and be more responsible about that space. I mean, like any craft, we're all learning. And I knew it was something that was always wrong and I look back then and I, I was thinking, I could have done better. And so it's okay to admit, I think, that, mm -hmm. and, but then to do better. Yeah. So it's evolved for me, Dawn, as a storyteller. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to now look at you know, dirty uh, supply chains, mm -hmm. where we have right. slave labor in the stuff that we wear right. here in America. Right, and that's, that's the case. Yes, everything, unless somebody here can raise their hand and say, and say I went purposely to buy a shirt that says it's sustainable. Anybody in here? Okay, one person. So that's very representative. How many more other people in the room, right? So it's like 2%. Yeah. The rest 
all include some form of slave labor. So we're talking just a bit ago about objectivity um, and, the, and the conflicts or the, the two charges that journalists have about objectivity and shining a light on injustice. Um, is there such a thing as objectivity, do you think? Um, or are there words like fairness and accuracy? Do, do they do it? Yeah. Um, being a rhetoric major, I would say <laughs> no. Um, but you try your darndest to do it, right? Mm -hmm. It's, uh, are, are, you, are you a person of Plato, where you believe there's some absolutes? Or do you believe, obviously, you know, I believe in the Socratic method, right? Uh, that we will sit here and we'll find the truth that way. Mm -hmm. So, and if you put on your religious hat, then you go, yes, of course I believe in the Platonic absolutes. Um, but I think in reality, we strive for objectivity. Mm -hmm. We're just not perfect. The question is how imperfect are we? And we'll have different gradations. I well, I have a different gradation depending on, on the story and, and the efforts that we might make. And there's different, you know, certainly there's certain core facts mm -hmm. to our, the stories we put together. Mm -hmm. And we, of course, we, we, we fact check everything. But for instance, when we have a breaking news story and there are death counts, interrupt me if you're going to. Okay, okay, keep going. I have one if, more. If there are death counts, <clears throat> we absolutely are super, super careful about that. Doesn't matter. Accuracy. Yes, if, if the AP says X, we will wait on, depending on the story, we will wait for our own fact-checking process to happen internally at, at, at NBC. Um, even though it's the AP and you know, the AP is the AP. Right, what about bias? What about the word bias, which sometimes is defined differently maybe than, people might have different definitions of bias, we all bring bias. Do you believe that? Do you think that there's that journalists have bias? Yes. Do they bring it out in their storytelling to, to an egregious level? What do, what do they do with it? Yeah. Right. I, I think my bias, as I said earlier, w is my experience and, mm -hmm. and, and, and that which I can bring to a story. And as I, as I get older, um, I'm glad that I bring on that, that bias, if you will. But the bias includes a lot of different things. It includes a lot of information. It's a life experience or what? Yeah, I mean, we, we can go into that space. But once we cross the line, and, and I shouldn't say the line, once we cross the threshold from, oh, I have all my thoughts and experiences and what I bring to it, when it comes to the story, I'm weeding all of that out. That is gone. But if it informs me to a story, I have a, so going back to trafficking, mm -hmm. I have a bias against trafficking. Right. So since I have a mm -hmm. bias against trafficking, what does that mean? Well, what it brought to me is into a space of now I'm looking at why does it happen no matter what country I go to report on it. Yeah. Gender inequality. Why does that happen? That's a, that's a broader question, mm -hmm. but it certainly under, helps me understand why we have trafficking. And the bias is what... So the bias has a lot of different uh, potential outlets to this mm -hmm. conversation, mm -hmm. but to, mm -hmm. to be, answer your question very straightforardly, yep. yes. Mm -hmm. And for me as a journalist, right. when it comes to telling a story, do I include that? Uh, no, I try my darndest, and my editors do a great job too of taking out any sort of uh, imbalance in the story. I wanna talk a little bit about MSNBC, and um, it's, so the shorthand for many people is it's the opposite of Fox News. I've never heard that. <laughs> it's a first time. <laughs> well, it, there's a first time for everything. First time for everything. I've never uh, heard that. I remember. Uh, we were talking earlier, uh, preparing for this evening, about some changes that MSNBC was making. Mm -hmm. And I just was curious if you could talk some more about that. They were about refocusing it. Um, more on news, but continuing to have opinion, but where it played in the programming. and. I wonder whether people recognize that, notice it, and right. maybe just talk a little bit about what MSNBC is thinking about on those, that part. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak for the network, right. uh, but what yeah. I can speak for is my observations as a consumer of news, uh, and, you know, going into, so I was just, I don't know if you've ever watched uh, West Wing at all, but um, <laughs> I went through the entire season uh, in the last year. 
just because I love the show. So and fun. Yeah. I was living abroad at the time, so I wasn't able to watch the show. And I just, you know, just it's just fun. Yeah. But I, I was looking at how MSNBC was portrayed throughout that series over the course of the years. Oh, interesting. And it was it was a news source. Yeah. Um, and you looked at you know the way they were expressing them, themselves. Then I think what you'll see uh, some of the um, observations of where we went in 2011 and 2012 is that MSNBC started to represent. Uh, a point of view uh, that was progressive and from the left. And it started with some hours and then became more hours and more hours. I think that was, that's a common observation of what happened back mm -hmm. in 2011, right. 2012. I think the observation that one might make today looking at some of the, the, uh, the critics out there, the TV critics who, who watch these sorts of things, is that within the last two or three years, you've seen those numbers of hours go down, mm -hmm. and that you will see instead um, progressive point of views only in the evening. And going up to that point, uh, hmm. you'll see that we, we have more hours that are news focused, where you have journalists that are anchoring, uh, and you also see those who have the point of view from the right who are anchoring. We had Greta Van Susteren, for instance, at one point. Mm -hmm. um, we have Nicole Wallace, we have Hugh Hewitt, uh, uh, here from this campus, right, right from, from Hoover. Um, and, and so our, our stable has grown to, I think, balance out what those uh, observers may have said was before, and, and more focusing on, okay, what is the news? I think what you'll, you'll hear from the, the leadership is that we're just trying to be smart. And, and that's always our drive. We, we just, we have to be thinking about whatever the content is. We can't just be giving, we have to think about, what's the context? Right. Why is that important? Right. And I think when we have folks like Brian Williams, for instance, at 11 p.m. right now, just as one example, he will give context to stuff that only he can, because he's right. been everywhere. Um, Lester Holt, the same. Mm -hmm. Nightly News, different product. He will give us content. He's a reporter's reporter, Lester yeah. Holt is. Yep. And a nice guy. Yeah. By the way, his nickname is Iron Pants. Iron Pants. <laughs> Why is that? Because he used to anchor for hours during breaking news stories <laughs> and never go to the bathroom. <laughs> hours and hours and hours and hours. He is the swellest Iron guy. Pants. Yeah. That's great. Swellest That's guy. That's great. Sorry, Lester. No, <laughs> Lester. Sorry, Lester. Um, thinking about the topic of tonight's discussion about how journalists cover bias, intolerance, and injustice, um, what are you most concerned about? Yeah. And what makes you feel most hopeful? So when I was stood in the streets um, of Ferguson, there were two parts of me. Uh, that were talking to each other. One was, wow, this is, this is really bad and difficult. The other part was, wow, didn't I do this like 20 years ago? Mm. Wait, wait, did... And then, so there's a third part too, which was, I'm glad I'm here. Because, and I, I can only imagine, because when, when I was there in the streets, those civil rights leaders that had worked through the 60s were still there in Ferguson wow. and returning to Ferguson and trying to give counsel to those who were new to the space. I consider myself new to the space. But I had to report on the issue of Rodney King from California as, one of my, as a cub reporter. Yeah. So I felt more comfortable standing in Baltimore looking at the, the many sides that were fighting against each other and angry at each other. And I was, you can see the tussle. Like I was glad that I was there because I, I think I was able to bring a sense of an understanding of the story. Mm -hmm. But I was also super upset as any American would be that we are going through this yeah. again. Yes. And then you send me to Baltimore and what am I doing? Again. So I was glad that I was sent there, Don, um, because again, as we were saying, perspective, yes. context. Mm -hmm. Now I would not lead in my reports about here we are again, or I remember the, uh, what it was like back during Rodney King. I wasn't there during the 60s, but you, I wouldn't lead with that. Mm -hmm. But I would suggest to my producer, to suggest to 30 Rock, to the anchor, feel free to ask them about what this 
historically might mean in, in our recent history. Yeah. And I would reflect on the Rodney King time with our time 20 years, and it was weird to think of 20 years later, because yeah. it wasn't, didn't seem that long to me. No. But having that historic perspective is really important and often missing, I think. And, and, we, and, and that's why I was glad yeah. to be there, yeah. because it was a responsibility as a journalist to do the best we could to share the pain. Like, that was really what I wanted to share. Like, this is all bad. But I, my job was to share the emotion and the pain that we all might feel, given who we are, given that we fight for this country to be a great place, and I needed to try to do that. But I also had to tell you what exactly what was happening that day. I mean, we were being shot at. We had security Ooh. teams that we being often... shot at. Yeah, we have security teams that we often would send to conflict areas mm -hmm. for the war correspondents here. I mean, we had that same team with us wow. in Ferguson. We also, when I had my gas mask issued to me, and, and I wasn't vlogging it, I didn't have my camera out, but I knew that was a moment when they were issuing my gas mask to me and giving me training on that as I arrived. I knew something was definitely different. Yeah. We're going to go to questions now. So the first question says, you mentioned telling stories from both sides slash perspectives. Mm -hmm. How do you, or do you, mitigate false equivalencies for the sake of telling both sides? Right. And so I, I don't think I should be the arbiter of what is equivalent and what isn't. And if I were to do that, uh, and it's way above my pay grade, what I do try to do is think of as a uh, argumentarian, you know, putting on my rhetoric hat. And again, it doesn't mean, I, don't, I know this is not the, the right or the best way, it's just the way I approach it, okay. is that I, you, uh, as the viewer being, and our viewers are, are, are very, very smart. And so we never ever treat them as, okay, we need to, you know, we need to, we need to go to the lowest common denominator. No, 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 no. What we need to do is bring what are the most what I believe are the most relevant facts out, not sensationalized, most relevant, mm -hmm. so that you digest it and you decide. The idea of false equivalency, yeah, sometimes like I brought up a couple examples where there is just no equivalency. Um, when it comes to healthcare, for instance, that is way above my pay grade, but I do my darndest to be a great student and then provide what I believe are the three biggest points on both sides. And some people say, but Richard, that's, in some cases, false equivalency. When, how can you not, I mean, the argument obviously is on one side, it doesn't everybody have the, the human right to health care. The other side is, shouldn't it be uh, an open market, free market sort of mm -hmm. debate mm -hmm. in terms of being able to access that right. and that you work towards it. I, I, I can't arbitrate the equivalence of that, but I try my best to be an honest uh, and inquisitive person. I try to be in your brain as, as being intellectually curious and, and trying to get the right answer out. That's what I try to do, and, and I don't get it right all the time. Great, thank you. Certainly. So this question is um, regarding people who are different from people in the Bay Area. <laughs> Um, in, well, that's in a, a different... Uh, okay, all right, okay. <laughs> no, there's a continuing problem with, I say maybe majority, continuing problem with bias in reporters' coverage, often against religious people, ordinary people in the heartland. Uh -huh. How do reporters maintain fairness? How do news organizations, what do, do news organizations do to promote, within their, promote it within their ranks? So coverage of people who are maybe not uh, celebrities, maybe not... People who are religious, right. people who are in the mm -hmm. heartland who may not get as much coverage so, as other people. Because so, the news organizations yeah. are tend to be on the coasts. I have ne never heard that before. You never heard um, that. Northeast-centric news, never heard about it. <laughs> have no idea what you're talking about. Um, I think what we're going to need... So there was a, a phase where we, our bureaus and all of our journalists in the room know this. There was a phase where we were seeing the number of bureaus across the country disappear from national uh, organizations. Yep. Yes. And I mean, it's not a complex answer, and, and you know this so well, Don. We just have to be there. Yep. 
And so I feel great benefit that I was able to live in the South for five years, the Midwest for two, and uh, California and, and, and New York uh, as well for, for many years, and abroad for other years. And I think that what we just need to go back to is go talk to them. Go talk when, to people. Right. Uh, so when I, I'm, I, I travel a lot, as you know, about, mm -hmm. about a half million miles a year. I touch, I don't know, 50, 60 different spots in the United States and the world. And I'll, I'll tell you just two stories, being in McMinnville, Tennessee, <laughs> at Friday Night Lights at a high school game, and two candidates, left and right, going for state assembly. I stand right next to them. They're standing right next to each other. And I say, hello. I said, let's take a picture together. Let's take a picture together. Now, that is what people don't necessarily know about politics in McMinnville, Tennessee. They get along. They're collaborative. They are gracious to each other. Mm -hmm. They do not fit the stereotypes mm -hmm. that we, and neither do the voters in McMinn, McMinnville, Tennessee, either. In Detroit, Michigan, when I go, go blue, when I go back to, to Michigan <laughs> to either do something for the university or tell yeah. stories. I was, I was just out there interviewing Emilio Gutierrez, who uh, is a journalist, a Mexican journalist, who fled to the United States for safety. And as I was up there speaking with him, obviously there's a, uh, an election going on, and the number of ads you saw from left and right mm -hmm. just engulfed the, 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 the airwaves. And when you spoke with folks, at least the ones I spoke to, they are those Midwestern voters that are the forever uh, uh, swing vote, if you will. They were passionate, um, and they were not of the space that I think that we, the stereotypes are often at. So to, the long answer to your yeah. short question <laughs> is how do we do that? We just yeah. go there and we talk to people okay. and we spend time so right. we can give context. Right. And so when I am doing stories, I brought up my visit to McMinnville many a time in the last month yeah. to offset what I think are easy lines that we get on Twitter, easy yeah, lines that we get from friends. Now, have you ever spent any time there? Have you, have you ever lived there? Have you gone to any of their churches? There we go. I'm gonna get a couple more questions in. Uh, anything to say about the current situation with Harvard admissions? which I think this is the story. What, yeah. is, that a, is that a university? <laughs> <laughs> we're that we're at Stanford, place? aren't we? Yeah, it's Come another on place now. on the other coast. Well, uh, if you're talking about admissions and you're talking about, um, uh, it's related, I think, specifically, we were talking yeah. about the Asian yeah. American yeah. admissions. I believe that's the story. That's right, and affirmative action. Mm -hmm. Affirmative action. So it's certainly something that's been debated in this state and other great states. Uh, and um, I, I think that, you know, and, and I did a story on this very dynamic of, okay, so I think it, it starts with, if Asian Americans are testing so well, shouldn't they just be able to get in? Why would you cap the number let in, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's mm -hmm. the basic question. Yeah. The debate here in California when it hit the ballot was, okay, do, do, does the university, Cal, public universities, do they eliminate that or not? All I can say is uh, it, it, it's, it needs to be worked out more. I, I know the debate when I was in the bus you're talking about, right. uh, about these sorts of topics, was um, why, am I, why is it more difficult for me to get into Berkeley? Mm -hmm. uh, and now it's even more difficult if you look like me mm -hmm. and you want to get into Berkeley. I know that, just the numbers. Yeah. But you also have to think about what public education means. The reason why I got into Berkeley in the end is because I wrote, I think, a protest letter. They were not gonna let me in. But I said to them, I was like, I, I worked for five years out of high school. I grew up with food stamps and poverty. We, we have an education system in this country, a public education system, which is, has a, one function. Every university has different functions, yep. but the public universities have one function, yep. so they say. Yep. And it says in the master plan, and I'm paraphrasing obviously, yep. the master plan uh, for the state of California said, hey, this is meant for you, Louis, or Wong. This is meant for you. <laughs> and so I wrote a protest letter when they didn't let me in, and I said, I'm that guy. 
I grew up with food stamps. I had to work at Mrs. Fields Cookies for five years, then go to City College of San Francisco. And now I'm applying to your four-year institution. And the, the, the master plan says, hey, this is for you, guys. This is for you. This is for you. Yeah. But you didn't let me in. So yeah. I wrote a protest letter, and they, they let me in. Wow. So our systems um, work for me in the end. Yep. But they have a certain culture and, I think, purpose. The issue of what's happening at Harvard and the issue with mm -hmm. our, our Asian American community is that it's an extremely diverse community mm -hmm. uh, with over 50 origin countries, with a very high performing upper 2% or something like that, that happens to apply yeah. to schools like Harvard and much better schools like Stanford and <laughs> have high acceptance <laughs> rates. Yeah. And, but you also have this other side of the, the, the ledger. I don't know if you know this, but over 50% of Asian Americans go to community college. Does that, that, does that fit the stereotype? No. 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 But that's the number. Yeah. That's the reality. Yeah. Did you know that the United Negro College Fund, that there's an equivalent for the Asian American community? No. There is. Did you know that in a lot of these... Uh, these uh, in, in these grant spaces, there, it's written in that it's all groups can benefit based on their socioeconomic status, except if you're Asian American, except if you're Asian American. That is why they started the equivalent to the United Negro wow. College Fund for Asian Americans. Yeah. It's, it's just not, the largest group in, in New York that lives in poverty, if you've been to New York lately and you've looked who's been going through the garbage cans over the last 20 years, they're Asian folks. 25% live in poverty in the Asian American community in New York City. Wow. They just don't necessarily like to talk about it as much. Yeah. Right. And so when you look at the dynamic of what's happening at Harvard, this is a s super small group. I think those that would be critical of the argument to get rid of that would say, well, didn't your parents benefit from affirmative action? Isn't that why you now have the ability to be critical of affirmative action? Those would be critical right. of those saying yeah. that. That's the op yeah. opposite argument. Yeah. Where I stand is not relevant, but I just know it's not going to be solved, right? Yeah. It's not going to be solved yeah. uh, like right now. But yeah. sorry, that's a, I had to be, go long on that one because it's clearly a complex it, issue. It, it is. And I'm going to do one quick last one. Yeah. Uh, and we're just about out of time. Um, so the question is about the ranks of broadcast journalism and the diversity since you've become an anchor. How hopeful are you for the future of diversity in the media? Ooh, in the media. So that's a big space. So you I would say- You can do broadcast journalism if you want. Yeah, I, well, I'll do, how about I'll do broadcast first. How, how hopeful are you for the future of diversity in broadcast journalism? You know, I, I think that um, I've seen in different stuff. In the time I've been at 30 Rock, I've seen the first African-American anchor take a seat that has never been held by a minority, Lester Holt. In the time I've been at 30 Rock, I've also seen the only Latino American male sit in an anchor seat in cable, Jose diaz Balart. I've also seen the first uh, Latino American anchoring a national nightly news broadcast uh, on the weekends, also Jose diaz Balart. So there's a lot of things that say, we're living in some pretty cool times. But I've also seen the numbers of diverse faces overall go down in broadcast, in, in, in network broadcast and cable broadcast TV go down mm. as well. Yeah. Not in, not whole, in certain yeah. spaces, and yeah. other places go up. Yeah. I, I'm not seeing as many faces like mine. I'm seeing fewer now. Mm -hmm. But I'm also seeing in media overall in the sort of 16 zettabyte space and the 44 zettabytes of content we'll see come 2020. That's where we're seeing a lot of diversity, not only in color of face, but also a background of state, of city, of particular background, whether it be a country you've come from, mm -hmm. point of view. And therein lies, because all of us are not only watching nightly news or cable, we're getting stuff from all over the place. And therein lies the silver lining that is actually getting really, really fat and chubby, that silver lining, because of the sheer amount of content we now have that is not re um, regulated by technology, what we call OTT now, right, over the top. 
It's going straight to all of us. Right. And that's the amazing thing. We can opt into all of this space. I'm super positive about what that means mm -hmm. in the end of the day, mm -hmm. because there's only so long that, as we know, especially being in a very creative space like Stanford and the Valley and California, that new models will often affect old models. Old models don't go away, they change or they do go away is what happens. And the new models also evolve yeah. and, and survive somehow. So I'm very, very positive. Great. Well, thank you, Richard. It's been a great conversation. I appreciate yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs>